Hello, in this video we're going to look at a couple more examples of recursion. We're going to look at one of the classic examples, the calculation of Fibonacci numbers. And in doing so, we're going to see that sort of like the straightforward approach to writing a recursive solution is not actually very efficient at all. And so we'll talk a little bit about how algorithm efficiency plays off with both recursive solutions and iterative solutions. And then we'll look at a couple of ways of doing recursion a little bit more efficiently for this case. And then the last example we'll have today is about using recursion sort of like to take advantage of the stack in cases where you kind of want to stack a data structure. And so when we talked about stacks, we looked at the example of the depth first search algorithm to solve a maze. And I'll show you how we can use recursion instead of having sort of an explicit stack in order to solve this problem too. So let's go ahead and take a look at the Fibonacci numbers. All right, so the Fibonacci numbers are a sequence of numbers where you start with one for the first number and then also one for the second number. And then each subsequent number is the sum of the two previous. So one plus one is two. And then we look at these two numbers and we say that one plus two is three. So three is the next number. Then two plus three is five. And three plus five is eight. Five plus 18 is, or rather five plus eight is 13. Eight plus 13 is 21. 13 plus 21 is 34. And we carry on like this finding the next number in the sequence by adding the two previous ones. This sort of like sequence of numbers sometimes shows up in nature and like biological settings, like the way trees branch off and things like that. Uh, so it's something that mathematicians have studied and we can calculate this using recursion. So we can write a method to return to us the Fibonacci number in a sequence. So we'll say that this is number one and two and three and four and so on. And so what we might want to do is write a function that computes what say the ninth or the 31st or the 82nd Fibonacci number is. Well, we can do that with recursion by saying as our base case that the Fibonacci of one is equal to one. And in this one, we'll also need a second base case because the Fibonacci numbers are formed by adding the two previous items. So we'll say that the Fibonacci of two is also equal to one. And then more generally, we can say that the nth Fibonacci number is equal to the Fibonacci one previous to that plus the Fibonacci number of two previous to that. And so using this sort of recursive definition of Fibonacci numbers, we can go ahead and implement this in a Java program, which we've done here in this fib.java file. So here we have our recursive Fibonacci number method that takes in the number of what Fibonacci we want and then returns to us the Fibonacci number associated with that. So we first have our base case here. I sort of combined them up. If the number is less than or equal to two, we return one. That's for these sort of two cases together. If the index we want, the number we want is less than or equal to two, we return one. Otherwise, we recursively call ourselves two times once with the number one previous to this, and again with the number two previous to this. And in main, we just print out the first 10 Fibonacci numbers. So let's go ahead and run this and see what happens. Again, I'll compile and run this. And we get, I just realized I have one and two and third, but uh, yeah, ignore that. We have 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55. So this does seem to be working and it implements this recursive definition of the Fibonacci numbers. The problem with this is that it's not actually going to be very efficient. What if I change this so that instead of printing the first 10, we want to print the first 50? Let's run it again and see what happens. We get all right to about 42 and then it starts taking longer and longer and longer to do this calculation and it's kind of hanging and it's taking more and more time so at 45 we're just sitting here for a while 46 you can see it sort of is dramatically slowing down as it gets to the 46th and 47th numbers so what's happening here let's take a look all right let's say we're calculating the fibonacci of I don't know, seven. We'll go ahead and we'll start by calling fib 
with seven as the parameter. And because that's not our base case yet, it's going to recursively call itself with the number two less and the number one less than that. So it's going to go ahead and split into two calls, one to find the Fibonacci of six and one to find the Fibonacci of five. Now, in order to find the Fibonacci of six, we have to, again, trigger our recursive case and find the Fibonacci of five and also the Fibonacci of four. Well, to find the Fibonacci of five, we have to find the Fibonacci of four and the Fibonacci of three. To do this, we have to do three and two. To do this, we have to do two and one. And now these ones that hit one or two bottom out, those are our base cases. When we have the Fibonacci of two, we just return one immediately. And when we have the Fibonacci of one, we just return one immediately. But these other ones here also trigger recursive cases. When I hit Fibonacci of three, we have to find the Fibonacci of two and the Fibonacci of one. When I hit this one, I have to find the Fibonacci of three and the Fibonacci of two. Finding the Fibonacci of three requires us to find the Fibonacci of two and one. And now when I go back over here, I have to do this recursive process again for four and three, three and two, two and one, and two and one. And only when I find all of these base cases hit, then do I start going back up the tree and doing these additions. And so the problem with this, well, one of the problems is that we're doing a lot of redundant work. I'm finding the Fibonacci of three, one, two, three, four, five times to calculate the same number, the Fibonacci of three. That's a huge waste of time. Likewise, if you look at it, I'm finding the Fibonacci of five twice, once over here, and then once over here. That's a huge amount of wasted work to do the exact same computation. Now, if we think about it, what would have to happen if I was going to find the Fibonacci of eight? Well, it would be kind of like this. I would shift this down, and to find the Fibonacci of eight, I'd find the Fibonacci of seven, and then the Fibonacci of six, which would be all of this stuff over here like this, copied over here as well to find the Fibonacci of six. This would be a, a really big waste of time. We're essentially doubling the amount of work we have to do every time we add a new number. This is sort of like the Towers of Hanoi problem where we have an exponential growth in the number of calculations we have to do. If we were to graph this, just like Towers of Hanoi, for each additional n that we have to compute, the number of steps that we have to do, the number of recursive calls is going up exponentially. This is a big O of two raised to the n power algorithm. You can kind of see it in the code when we look at it because what's happening is we're splitting off and we're doing one, two recursive calls for every number that we want to compute. And so it's sort of like a pyramid scheme in a way. You know, you say like, oh, I find two people and then they each find two people and then they each find two people and it sort of grows exponentially. That's what's happening here as well. But unlike with the Towers of Hanoi, the Towers of Hanoi is sort of like intrinsically exponential because it just takes that many number of moves to move the rings. But this one isn't intrinsically exponential. It's just the way we've implemented with this redundant work of computing the Fibonacci of six two times. So sometimes I guess the lesson here is that the natural recursive solution can be like super duper slow and unnecessarily slow. There are better algorithms for this. Something else I wanna emphasize real quick is that Problems don't have big O's. They don't have efficiencies. Algorithms do. So just because you find a solution to a problem that's inefficient doesn't mean, of course, that there is no better algorithm that solves that same problem. This simple sort of straightforward recursive solution to the Fibonacci numbers is super duper slow, but there are faster ones. Let's look at one using a loop. So the way this algorithm is going to work is we're going to just generate the sequence of numbers up to where we want. So if we want the ninth Fibonacci number, we just start at one and carry on calculating them until we get to nine and then finish. To do that, we have to keep track of the previous two numbers. So I'll say that A is equal to the number two numbers ago, ago, and then B is equal to the number that is one previous. So let's go through an example real quick and see that. 
let's say we want to compute the Fibonacci number five. So I'll say again that number is equal to five and n is the Fibonacci number that we actually want to compute here. So we're going to start off by saying that a is equal to one and b is equal to one. Then we're going to loop five times until we get here. So what we do is each time through the loop we set n equal to a plus b, which in this case gives us two, and then we go ahead and copy b into a, so a gets replaced with one, and we copy n into b, so b gets replaced with two, and then we carry on. We set n equal to a plus b, which will be three. Then we replace a with b and b with n, and go ahead and loop again, and then we're gonna set three equal to a plus b, which is five, and then we replace a with b and b with a, and then we break out of the loop because we've gotten to five. We also need to keep track of the number of iterations of this. And so then we return this number here. All right, so now in this Fibonacci.java file, I've added in addition to the recursive Fibonacci method, an iterative Fibonacci method using a for loop. This one works along the lines we just talked about where we're passed in the number that we want to compute the Fibonacci of, we keep track of a and b, which are the two previous Fibonacci numbers to us, and n, which is the Fibonacci we're currently on. Then we loop starting at two up into the number we want to compute, and each time through, we add the two previous numbers to get the next one, n, then update our previous one. So b is copied into a, and then n is copied into b, and at the end of this, we return the Fibonacci number we got. Now in main, we print both the recursive Fibonacci numbers and also the iterative Fibonacci numbers. So let's compile and run this and see how it's going to do. If I do that, we'll see that the first 10 are computed pretty fast either way. But let's go ahead and increase the numbers and see how it does. So remember, this started slowing down a lot around like 45 or so. So let me replace this with 45 for both and repeat this process. And again, the recursive solution starts slowing down quite a bit and we'll finally finish 44 and then 45 soon. Oh, and then the iterative ones are done in a blink of an eye just as soon as the iterative number is finished. Rather, as soon as the recursive number is finished, this finished as well. Let's see how far we can take it. If we increase this to say 100, and I'll just comment this out for now. Let's see how much time this takes. Well, doing 100 is just as fast as doing 45. It finished in the blink of an eye. Unfortunately, we overflow the long integer that we're using in Java when we get to the 92nd Fibonacci number, or rather the 93rd. And after that, our results are meaningless, but it still finished the process super fast. So what's the big O of this iterative solution now? Well, we said this one was big O of two to the N, which is extremely slow. This one is a little bit faster, obviously. And let's think about how much faster. Well, the number that we want is our N, right? If we want the 92nd Fibonacci number, then that is our N, the, the number that we want. And if you look at it, we have a loop that goes basically up to N and does a constant amount of work inside of it. So that is big O of N, which is what this one is, significantly faster than the recursive solution. Now this is a case where I feel like, maybe you don't feel like this, but I feel like this is an easier algorithm to understand. This is extremely straightforward to me. And based on the definitions of Fibonacci numbers, I feel like this is easier to arrive at than this one, which is a little bit more complicated of like shuffling the numbers around. And so this is a case where you shouldn't just use the straightforward algorithm. You should think a little bit more about the efficiency and try to come up with something faster. So in this case, the more natural recursive solution is actually really inefficient. And the more natural looping solution is much more efficient. So that's interesting, but let's dig just a little bit deeper into this because I don't want the takeaway from this to be that, well, loops are fast and recursion is slow because really that's not the case. Really, it's not the recursion that's slowing us down. It's just the kind of crappy algorithm we're using. So we can, in fact, make this algorithm, this recursive algorithm, a lot faster than 
or not a lot faster than the iterative one, but a lot faster than it is now using something called memoization. So let's take a look at that. Now, this word memoization, I thought the first time I read it that it was a typo for memo, right? memorization, right? With an R here. But memoization is actually its own thing. It's a concept in computer science that basically means you save the intermediate results that you have so that you can reuse them if necessary. And it lets us do this sort of straightforward recursive algorithm without having to do all of the duplicated work that we did before. So if you remember when we were computing the Fibonacci number seven, we had to then compute the Fibonacci six. And to do that, we had to compute the Fibonacci of five. And for that, we had to do it of four. And for that, we had to do it of three. And for that, we had to do it of two. And then that one returned right away. And that one returned us the value one. Now in memoization, you have this table over here of your past results. And what you do in this table is every time you compute a Fibonacci number, you store the result in this table. So when I find out that the Fibonacci number of two is one, I put that one inside of this table. Then I would return back up to three and I'd find the Fibonacci number of one and I would see that it is equal to one and I would then store that in the table as well. So far, this isn't super helpful, but then what would happen is when I return from the Fibonacci of one back into the Fibonacci of three, I add those two values together and find that the Fibonacci number three is equal to two. Well, I store that in the table as well and then return back up to the four. When the four goes to find the Fibonacci number of two, it doesn't have to recurse. Instead, it'll just look in this table and see that this value is equal to one and it will return it back up. Then the Fibonacci number of four will compute that the Fibonacci of three plus the Fibonacci of two is equal to three, and it will save that in the table as well. Then when we go back up to the Fibonacci of five, it will have gotten the Fibonacci number four, but now it needs to find the Fibonacci number for three. But this is not going to cause another chain of recursion. Instead, it just goes to the table and sees that that's equal to two. It already has that value. So then it does the Fibonacci of four plus the Fibonacci of three, which is five. And so it finds that the Fibonacci number for five is five. And so it's going to store that in the table as well. Then when we get up here to the Fibonacci number of six, when we're computing that, it has returned that the Fibonacci number for five is five, and it's going to then want to find the Fibonacci number for four, right? But it's not going to look it's not going to cause this chain of recursion to happen again. Instead, it just goes to the table and sees that that's equal to three, and it'll find that the Fibonacci number for six is therefore eight, which it stores in the table. Then we return back up here, and the Fibonacci number for seven is going to want to find the Fibonacci number for five. Well, it'll just look in the table and see that that's five, add those two together to get 13, and then store that in the table. And so now this is what our tree looks like each Fibonacci number is only computed all the way down one time. And then after that, we just use this lookup table to find all of the new values that we need to compute. So let's think about then what would happen if we instead had wanted to find the Fibonacci number for eight, like before. Well, we would just go ahead and have the Fibonacci number for eight do all this work over here that we had already just done. And then it would also look up the value for six, but because that's duplicated, that already exists over here, it would just look that up from the table and then add these two values together to get the new value. Each new number that we add doesn't double the amount of work like it did before. Instead, it only adds a fixed amount of work each time we increase. And so that makes this a linear algorithm as well. If we were to graph n with the number of steps, it would be some sort of linear algorithm. So this is big O of N, just like the fast one that we did for using a loop. The downside though, is that we have to have this lookup table. So it takes more memory than the loop based one, but in terms of the runtime, it's the same. Let's see what this looks like in terms of the code. All right, here I have the memoized version of our recursive Fibonacci number calculator. Now we have this array called results that keeps track of all of our past results. Inside of the recursive method, now what we do is the very first thing we do is we check this table and we say, if the number that we're trying to find the Fibonacci number for already exists in this table, it's not equal to zero, just run it, return it out of the lookup table instead. And 
only if it's not there do we carry on and do the rest of the method. So if this is a new Fibonacci number we haven't ever had to calculate before, then what we do is we do the base case thing and we say if the number is less than two, first of all, stick it in the table so we don't have to get to this point again and then just return one. That's sort of, sort of our base case thing happening again. Then we do the recursive part of this. We find the answer as being equal to the recursive number, the recursive Fibonacci of the number one previous to us and two previous to us, just like before, add them together. And then before returning this result, we stick it in the lookup table. Inside of main, we just make the lookup table equal to a new table of longs 1000 big, and then we call our recursive method from one up to 100 again. So let's compile and run this and see what happens. All right, I'll do java c fib memoized.java and then run this version of the program and it goes as you can see just as fast as the loop based one and of course we have this sort of uh, overflow error but the actual algorithm is working correctly and it's going much faster this big o of n time just like the other one. So memoization is kind of a cool technique because it lets you take the more, in my opinion anyway, the more straightforward algorithm the recursive one that was really, really, really slow. And it lets us improve the efficiency of it dramatically without having to like greatly change the algorithm. The basic way we were computing them is exactly identical. We are just getting rid of the redundant work of doing the same ones over again by adding this lookup table idea. All right, the next thing that we're gonna talk about, which is gonna be our last example of a recursive method is I titled it using recursion as a stack but maybe using recursion for the stack might be a better title. Basically the idea is here that anytime you have an algorithm that can make use of a stack, you can use the stack that recursion gives you to sort of implement that same idea. So when we talked about stacks, one of the things we talked about was this DFS algorithm. And in this algorithm, you sort of have this maze, like this one maybe, where you want to go in and you want to go out. Of course, DFS can be used for lots of different searching problems. It doesn't have to be a maze. That's just the example we used. And in doing this with DFS, we use the stack to keep track of the areas we have left to search. So we go ahead and sort of push the areas onto the stack that we want to search. And each time we had a decision to make, like whether to go this way or this way, we pushed both directions on. So we might push the right direction and then we would push the down direction and then pop the down direction off the stack to decide to go here, leaving this one on the stack as sort of an unsearched path that we were going to return back to at a later point. Let's look at the code for that real quick so we can familiarize ourselves with how that worked. All right, here's the code that we came up with this. It works, here's sort of the, the basic outline of the algorithm. We keep going until we get to the end, find the thing we're looking for. We mark where we're currently at then we did some printing. Um, then this is the core of the algorithm. We check if we can go left, and if so, we push left onto the stack. We check if we can go right, and if so, we push right onto the stack. We check if we can go to the bottom, and we push bottom onto the stack if so. And if we can go to, up to the top, we push that position onto the stack. If the stack is empty, there's no path found. Otherwise, we get the next position off the stack. It's sort of maybe more natural to write algorithms that rely on a stack like this using recursion instead, because we don't really need to make our own stack to do these things. Instead, we can just rely on the method call stack. And the way that will work essentially is rather than pushing this here, we'll just recursively search to the left and here we'll recursively search to the right. And only if that doesn't find a solution will we come back up to this version of the method and carry on. So let's see what that looks like. Here I have a program that does exactly that. This program is called DFS recursive.java. And inside of it, we have this method for doing the searching. We have to put it in its own method now because if it's gonna be recursive and call itself, it can't do all the like main stuff as well. So here we start by just printing out where we are in the maze. We check if we're done. And so if we get to the end position, we return true. That's sort of one of our base cases here. Then we mark this spot as being seen, just like we do before. The maze is passed in uh, as an array by reference. So any changes we make to it in one call will be affected with the other calls as well, because there's only one maze. We just have a reference to it. Then here we do the recursive bit of this. We check if we can go left 
And if so, we recursively call ourselves on the left direction. So we search the maze one spot to the left with x becoming x minus one and y coming in with the same value. And if that returned true, so if we did find a solution to the left, then this one returns true as well. Otherwise, it will just carry on. And so we'll search the entire left half from where we are now looking for a solution. And if we find one, we say, okay, we're done. We don't have to carry on any further. But if we search that entire left direction and didn't find the way forward, then we go and we try going to the right and we search the entire right direction. And if we found a way out that way, we return true, otherwise we carry on. So it's still depth first search. The way that recursion works with the stack is this method's not gonna return until it has exhausted all of its possibilities as well. Then we do the same thing for the bottom and then for the top. And if we get all the way through and none of these searches returned true, that means there must have been no way forward and so we return false. The main just does the same thing we did last time, sort of setting up the maze and then it searches the maze starting at zero, zero and prints either done or no path forward. So this is a maybe slightly more intuitive, maybe once you get used to the idea version of the depth first search algorithm, it relies on recursion and it still is using a stack. It's just now instead of explicitly making a stack and doing the pushing and popping ourselves, we're relying on the recursive method calls to do the stack bookkeeping for us. So like usual, the notes for this page contains all of the examples we have, including this recursive D DFS example. So doing recursion, there's sort of three major things that you have to worry about, like we've talked about. You have to find some way to break the bigger problem into smaller ones and bite those off one by one. So in the depth first search example, we, in order to search the maze, we broke that into the smaller problems of searching to the left, searching to the right, searching up and searching down. Then you have to make sure there's a base case. So in the recursive example, the base case is either if none of the paths led anywhere, we return false, or if we get to the final end goal, we return true. And you have to make sure the general case gets us closer to the base cases. That's uh, to make sure that you actually hit that base case eventually, which in the depth first search example will be true too, right? Because we'll either find that there's no path or we'll have searched the entire thing, in which case there will be no more ways to go. All right, so that's all for this week on recursion. We're gonna see more examples of recursion as we go. Next week, we're gonna be looking at searching and sorting algorithms. And one of our searching algorithms and one of our sorting algorithms are recursive. So we'll see more examples of this. We'll also see it again when we hit binary search trees, because like I said at the start of this, they use recursion sort of inherently. So hopefully recursion is starting to make good sense to you. Um, it's one of those things you kind of have to see a few times before it like really like solidifies in your mind. So hopefully that's happening. As always, if you have any questions on anything, please let me know. I'd like to hear from you. Bye.